tonight's Conversations of Great Minds, I'm joined by Gerald Posner. Gerald Posner was one of the youngest attorneys ever hired by the Wall Street firm, uh, law firm Kravath, Swain and & Moore, and is the author of 11 books, including New York Times bestsellers and one a finalist for the Pulitzer in history. Gerald has written dozens of articles for national magazines and papers and has been a regular contributor to a variety of television networks. He's also the author of the new book, God's Bankers, a history of money and power at the Vatican. Gerald joins me now from our Miami studios. Gerald Posner, great to see you again. Thanks for joining Thanks us. To see you again, Tom. Thank you for having you me. You keep cranking out these brilliant, massive books. Uh, let's start with you. What got you interested in the history of the Vatican and the Vatican Bank? Uh, you know, uh, I, Tom, I didn't really know that it was going to be a story about the Vatican Bank. Uh, what, uh, what sort of stuck in my mind was something back in the 1980s when I was researching a book on Joseph Mengele, the Nazi doctor from Auschwitz, who was called the Angel of Death. Uh, I was down in South America in Buenos Aires, and I got access to federal police archives about Mengele. And, and when I was in there, I found that some of the other Nazis that had traveled to South America and to Buenos Aires had gone in there after the war with the help of a priest in inside of Rome and a bishop inside of Rome and I put in the back of my mind that one day I'd like to return to the story of what was that possible Vatican connection to fleeing Nazi fugitives when I finally found a publisher a couple of decades later who was willing to look into that it turned out that I was much too narrowly focused it wasn't just a story of the Vatican the Nazis in World War II but it was a story I should have known about follow the money and following the money became larger and larger and it ended up as you now see a 200 year history of follow the money inside the Vatican. Wow. So this started with your, your book, Mengele. You know, right. Yeah, that's, that's remarkable. Uh, what, where do the roots of the Vatican Bank start? How deep are they? How old are they? When was this bank officially created? Well, you know, that's the key. The answer to that question, when was the bank officially created, will tell you a lot about the bank because it was created in the middle of World War II. And, you know, there's a question even as to why does the Vatican need a bank? This bank is sort of like a cross between what I call a, a central bank and sort of like a mid-level investment bank on Wall Street. It's an odd hybrid. It only has one shareholder, the Pope. It doesn't have to turn a profit, which is a little odd in its charter. It doesn't make loans. Uh, it, it, the only uh, branch is in Vatican City. And it was started in the middle of World War II in 1942, in part because the financial wizard, this layman who was running the Vatican's money, together with the Pope, decided they needed a bank to stay off the radar because American and British intelligence were looking to stop countries like the Vatican, you have to remember it's a country as well as a religion, from doing business with the Nazis and with and fascist Italy. And in order to continue to do the business with the Germans and the Italians, they decided a bank was the way to do it. And so that was the birth of the bank. Wow. What kind of business did the Vatican want to continue doing with the Nazis? Tom, you will not be surprised to find out that all the Vatican was interested in doing on both sides was making money. So this was about profits. I, I don't want any, I think that my book's the first one that establishes how they did business with the Germans. They, you know, it's been rumored for years that they did, but nobody could figure out quite how. Um, I show how the, the Vatican Bank took shares through Italian proxies, friends of the people inside the Vatican who were running these insurance companies, uh, mostly Italian insurance companies, who were in business with German insurers in Eastern Europe where all the battles were going on. And then in 43 and 44, as the war was progressing, these insurance companies started to cheat the life insurance policy of Jews that were being sent to death camps and dying. The insurance executives sat around a table and said, hey, you know, these people are already dead. We take the cash value of their policies now. We, we take them out. It'll increase our profits. So the Vatican, without even knowing, was earning outsized profits by those investments. The, they didn't want the Germans to win. They just wanted to make money all around. So they were invested in America in stocks. They moved gold over here because they were afraid that gold reserves could fall to the Nazis. They invested in real estate in London and prime real estate that they still have today. Uh, and they also did business with the Germans and Italians. So nobody should be surprised by this. They were equal opportunity profiteers. Mm. They wanted to make money. And then when they saw the war was going against the Germans in 44, you see how they start to peel back their involvement with the Nazis. And come the end of the war, Tom, they stand up and they say, hey, we were only neutral. And nobody could figure it out because of the Vatican Bank, what they had done, and they got away with it. What, what, what astonished me, uh, Gerald Posner, was that at, at a point within, I believe, within my lifetime, 
Um, the Catholic Church looked around and said, oh, wait a minute, we're almost broke. Do I have that right? You're absolutely right. As a matter, it, it, you know, it's remarkable how many times the, the Pope or the Vatican, you'll hear appeals for money. And, you know, one of the things they'll say is, we're, we're, ne we're nearly, uh, you know, we're not making it. We're going under. We're about to go bankrupt. Well, I'll tell you one thing. In the 1980s, there was a moment in which the Vatican was near bankruptcy. And why? Because the Vatican Bank had gotten involved with a couple of Italian businessmen, a banker who ended up dead under a London bridge, and, and, a, and a top financier who ended up dead inside an Italian jail of cyanide poisoning. They said it was suicide. They were in hundreds of millions of dollars of fraudulent loans back and forth. The Italians tried to indict the head of the Vatican Bank, who was an American archbishop, and his two top lay aides, the Vatican shielded them by putting them in Vatican City. And eventually, Tom, the Vatican had to pay a quarter billion dollars as, quote, moral consideration to the banks for the fraud that they had been involved with. That almost brought the Vatican Bank down. They were on the verge of true bankruptcy, but they survived it, and they kept making appeals all the time for more money from the faithful. That's, that's uh, astonishing. The... Um if the bank, if the Vatican Bank is working as a central bank, what's what's the currency that they're working in? Are they are they issuing uh, their own currency like a sovereign nation? No, you know that's a great that's a, a great question. The the currency that they relied on for so many years was the Italian lira. So when the Italians were running the lira, the Vatican was also running the lira, and it's one of the reasons the Vatican Bank became, by the way a great money laundering location for the mafia inside of Italy, for wealthy Italians who wanted to avoid taxes. They're dealing in the same currency. And as you know, Vatican City is this little two-tenths of a mile wide piece of property that's deemed a sovereign country because Benito Mussolini, the fascist dictator, struck a deal with them in 1929 that said, you're sovereign. So here they are in the heart of Rome. There's no wall around Vatican City. So they have a bank inside. You live in Rome and you're a very wealthy Italian or you're a mobster in Sicily. All you have to do is find a cleric inside of Vatican City who's willing to take your money physically in a truckload. You can move it in millions of liras or in gold bullion and put it into a bank account or a foundation account or a charitable account in the Vatican Bank and poof, it disappears. That's the end of it. No one in Italy or any other country can follow it. So this fueled the growth of the Vatican Bank over time. Once Italy abandoned the lira and said, we're using the euro, the Vatican was at a crossroads in 2000. They debated, what should we do? And they came to what you said a moment ago. Should we produce our own coins? They do make these gold commemorative coins, but they're collector's pieces, not real currency. And they decided to go with the euro. And that is what's changing right now the culture of the Vatican Bank. They are having to reform it and open it up to transparency because European regulators are demanding that as a, as a condition of them using the euro. Otherwise, they never even would have opened the doors to anybody. So they were, they were perfectly happy being this corrupt, basically, mafia bank, mafiosa bank uh, in Italy. And, and uh, some of the priests were operating as, as money launderers or as shills for people who wanted to hide money. And now they're being challenged by presumably the Germans and the French, the, you know. But, uh, exactly. They're Brussels. being challenged by Brussels. And, and you know, something you said very interesting before, which is it's not just I don't want your listeners and especially the politically savvy people are listening to your show, Tom, to think that it's just uh, wealthy people trying to avoid taxes or some mobsters who are trying to launder money. The key part of the Vatican Bank's sort of partnership here was with the conservative political element in Italy. So, and they did this after the war in the 1940s. The Pope at the time, Pius XII, who had been the Pope during World War II, formed an alliance with, with the Americans, and we sent um, so-called black money through the CIA over to them to help fund a fight for the first election in 1948. The Vatican was petrified that the so-called Reds were going to win and the communists would win the polls. They were really vying for that election, but the Christian Democrats won. Over the Italy, decades, right? in, Italy. in Italy, and over the decades, the Christian Democrats, those top members of their party, have been some of those who have used and abused the Vatican bank accounts the most. Uh, Giulio Andriotti, who was the seven-time prime minister of Italy, the most powerful post-war Italian figure, 
ended up having a Vatican bank account under something called the Foundation for Cardinal Spellman. There was no such thing. It didn't exist outside of the Vatican Bank. Through that, he ran about $60 million. A monsignor inside the Vatican Bank ran it. $60 million. It was paid out as a slush fund to other politicians. Uh, he was never indicted over this. He died before he, uh, charges were ever brought uh, to everybody, to his wife's jeweler, you name it, to all types of friends. And other members of the Christian Democratic Party had their accounts inside the Vatican Bank. That gave the Vatican some strength whenever there was a conservative government in power. So they formed this alliance together with the politicians on the right to protect themselves. So were they deep in bed with Berlusconi? I mean, he was, he's probably the most famous hardcore right-wing politician to come out of Italy in this generation. A absolutely. You know, the, uh, everything that Berlusconi has done, the one thing he does not appear to have done is have had an account at the Vatican Bank. <laughs> he probably didn't need an account at the Vatican Bank. There's no evidence that he did. Right. But he's very interesting because he pops up a number of times in the book, including the fact that he was a young junior member at the time with a television station of a group called Propaganda Due, uh, P2, which was a Freemason group banned in Italy that, uh, that was doing business with the Vatican and the head of the Vatican Bank that when it was finally disbanded in the 80s, it included about a thousand members, including members of Italian intelligence, bankers, financiers, guys like Berlusconi. It was dubbed a, a government within a government. It was so powerful. This was the type of group the Vatican was sitting in bed with. Berlusconi was part of that, but not financially doing business with the Vatican. Well, Berlusconi is, has been brought down. In fact, he's been subject to a fair amount of ridicule. And, uh, you know, Italy, I mean, it's not a, a hotbed of liberalism, but um, how is that working for the Vatican Bank, that they don't have a right-winger in their camp? Or do they? Is there a, a replacement? We have about a minute before the break here, Gerald. No, no there, is, there is no replacement for them, but the replacement in part, Tom, has been Francis, Pope Francis, because he comes in and he really has what I call, you know, in his heart, if you really stripped him down, he would be proud to tell you he was a socialist. I mean, he may not say sure. it in so many words, but he comes from those Jesuit roots, liberation theology, although he never embraced it openly. I think that's very much his background. He talks about that. So he's appealing to the Italian left and Renzi, the current government, more than any other pope has, certainly more than John Paul, the Polish pope, who was a right-wing warrior and was together with Reagan and Thatcher fighting, uh, fighting communism. Right. It's, it's, it's a remarkable... A remarkable thing. You you tell this amazing story in the book about this guy. You you mentioned it earlier, who was on suicide watch. You know, one of the the Vatican bank. He they were making his food in the dispensary under observation. They were sealing it so it could only be open in his jail cell, and still somehow they managed to get cyanide in and kill this guy. I want you to tell the story of that. You footnoted it with a little story that you were told by somebody who knew him. We'll get to that right after this. We're talking with Gerald Posner. God's Bankers is his new book, A History of Money and Power at the Vatican. Stick around.